Welcome to this presentation on the understanding of customary peoples. The purpose of this presentation is to explain the Indigenous peoples' perspective on land. And to do this, we have to look a little bit more closely into Indigenous peoples' understanding of themselves and, in fact, the nature of the entire world. From this understanding, it becomes considerably easier to understand the issues for valuation, which is what we eventually want to conclude on. The purpose of this presentation is not so much to be a complete presentation in itself, but rather to put into some kind of context the readings that you'll find in the remainder of the module. The important starting point for understanding Indigenous people is to understand the notion of the tribe. The tribe is something which is a stumbling block for Western people. When we look at a group of Indigenous people, we would describe them as the tribe. However, the tribe is not those people who we see because its membership actually includes all ancestors and future peoples who belong to that people, not just the currently living people. This means that the tribe that Western people see is only a very tiny fraction of the entity which Indigenous people understand to be the tribe. This is something like looking at the rings of a tree after it's been chainsawed down and seeing or believing that we understand the tree. All we've actually seen is one narrow, tiny slice, one infinitesimal speck in time. The whole tree is something a lot more than that one flat circle of tree rings. The same thing with the tribe. For Western people to understand the power of the tribe in their, under, in their understanding of themselves is rather difficult. This is because we live in a very individualistic culture. And for about the last 500 years or so, Western people of European origin have been leaving behind their sense of family and tradition. And while some might have a genealogical interest into their family history, we no longer have a sense of intimate connection with our ancestors, even in, say, the extent that Asian people might, in their habit of respecting their family so much that they will put their family name before their personal name, unlike the practices in the West. If all people, both ancestors and future generations, are an active, equal part of the tribe, they all have equal rights. And this means that the current living people are in fact custodians of the tribe who are there temporarily bringing a bridge between the ancestors who give the stories and traditions, the understandings, the customs, the laws, the spirituality of the tribe, and linking that background onto the future with a fundamental obligation to bring children up into the same understanding, in much the same way that every level up a tree connects to the other and is in fact meaningless and dead without it. For indigenous people, they would understand their very understanding of themselves, their humanity, as being in connection, in a living connection, with both the past and the future. We'll move now from the tribe to the land itself. In the West, we can consider what we will call the problem of land ownership. And that's the problem that is behind the difficulty when I attempt to say, this land is mine. As Western people, we get our property title from the government that administers and originates our sense of order when it comes to allocating little bits of the Earth's surface to each other. However, we don't often plumb the question of where the government gets it from. When indigenous people ask this question, they come to a very simple conclusion. And that is that the one thing we can conclude from the nature of the earth, 
the land around us, the sky, every part of nature. The one thing we can conclude from it is that it does not make itself. The chemical makeup of our planet is such that it cannot support itself. It does not make itself. It is the sort of stuff which cannot self-generate. It is not the meaning, the reason of its own existence. Everything that we see, when we see a tree, or a cow, or a mountain, or a person, we see something which comes into existence as the result of the agency of something else, using raw materials that the thing itself cannot manufacture. Somehow, they too have come from somewhere else. The conclusion of indigenous people, almost universally, is that the one thing they know for certain, leading on from this, is that if the earth exists and it has no reason, no apparent reason for its nature to be eternal without a beginning, it must have been made by something that does have no beginning, something which is outside the material realm, something which is supernatural and something which is both powerful and intelligent. This is the simple conclusion that indigenous people without fail make regardless of whether they're on an isolated Pacific island or in Africa or South America or even in the chilly wastes of Northern Europe. The simple conclusion that indigenous people have come to manifests in many different ways. And so there are many different spiritualities. Each people, each tribe, have their own understanding of what made the world. In many cases, this consists of stories relating to the doings of supernatural beings which made the world in some beginning event and somehow communicated the world to the people. In a few cases, the Genesis event, the initiation of the cosmos, happened as a result of some sort of supernatural but unintelligent event that just happened to concurrently make the people as well. This is important for indigenous people because although they might recognize that they are fundamentally different from trees and rocks and the earth, the fact that their origin ultimately is intimately connected with those things means that those things are as close to them as their siblings, as their parents as even perhaps the finger on their hand. And so one way or another, whether the land was made by supernatural spirits or gods, or as a result of some unintelligent event which happened to concurrently make the people, indigenous people have a conclusion which gives them a very solid understanding of where the land comes from and fundamentally who owns it. And in this way, indigenous people have a simple but very alternate view that answers the question of our problem of ownership. Because for them, it is simply a matter of connecting the Genesis event, the origin of the land, with some connection to the tribe. When we think of land title in the West, we think of the right supported by government sanction, in other words, the government will have laws against trespass and so on, that enables me to possess a particular part of the Earth's surface to the exclusion of all other people. And it is really the power of the government, its military strength, its ability to do violence to people that violate the rules that it sets out, that gives us a land title. However, this is not usually the origin of ownership. If I was to write a poem, or paint a picture, or do some other creative activity, very few people would be deny my right to say that I own my poem or my painting. It is naturally mine. It is mine because of the nature of the way it came into being. I made it, and so it belongs to me. I can then sell it or give it away. And the people that receive it from me 
receive my ownership communicated to them, and so they become the valid owners, especially if they pay me a reasonable sum for it. And so the nature of land title is fundamentally different to our ownership of just about everything else, in that everything else belongs to the person that made it. However, Indigenous people are able to apply this simple notion of what we could call natural ownership, even to land itself, because in general they consider that it came from, remember, the created act of the gods. And so it belongs to the gods. This is well illustrated in Tonga, where it is believed that the chiefly families on Tonga are descended from the supernatural entities that made the Tongan Islands. What this means is the chiefs naturally own it as a way of father to child inheritance. And from that, it is then passed out to others. In most other indigenous communities, there is some story which connects the original created event with a set of laws and customs that the creative beings, the gods, also gave to the people. And so there's always a connection between land ownership in the minds of indigenous people with their spirituality, their stories of the creation, their stories of the guiding spirits. This is illustrated in the example of the Murray Islands. The Murray Islands are the part of Australia where indigenous title, customary title to land, was first recognised as a result of what is known as the Mabo case, which was Eddie Mabo complaining to the government that he really did have title to land which preceded Western land rights. On the Murray Islands, the Murray Islanders understand that the Murray Islands were created as a result of the actions of a deity, a supernatural being, known as Marlow. Marlow occasionally uh, manifests as a form of supernatural octopus. However, Marlow, as a being itself, is a supernatural being, not tied to any, hum uh, any material form. Marlow is understood to have created both the Murray Islands and then the Murray Islanders themselves. Furthermore, Marlow directly communicated the laws and customs of the Murray Islanders to the first generation of that tribe. And these have been passed down faithfully from parent to child ever since. What this means is that land title originates naturally for indigenous people and it is communicated through the tribe as part of that ancestor to progeny continuity which the currently living members of the tribe happen to be one tiny part of. It means that land title, while it comes naturally, is the result of a gift or a transfer from the gods to the people and then from the older people to the younger people and so on. However, it's given to the tribe conditionally and this means that it isn't simply maybe a freehold relationship where it is given and they can do what they like to it. It is given to them on the condition that they use the land in conformity with their understandings of the customs, traditions, laws and spirituality. One of the common attributes of those customs and traditions and laws that you find universally across the planet is the reluctance, in fact usually expressed as a strong prohibition, on the sale and alienation of the tribe's land. It is generally understood that the land has been given to the tribe by the creative spirit for the use of the tribe, for the good of the tribe. It belongs to the whole tribe equally. This means it belongs equally to the ancestors and to the future generations yet to come. And the land itself is a part of the tribal customs and law of the tribe. It therefore is a vital part of the morality, the principles of action that the tribe adopts, its ethics to use the modern term. 
We can see, therefore, that property is a part. It follows on from the tribal spirituality. And in fact, customary title is almost meaningless without that original connection to tribal spirituality. It means it's not simply a matter of the indigenous people arriving and taking the land, but rather of the land being freely and conditionally awarded. It means that land title is always a complex set of rights and obligations that the current owners, those living, are able to enjoy so long as they follow the traditions of the uh, tribe. And one of those is that they undertake to pass the land on without any detriment onto the future. Now this produces a dilemma when it comes to sale or alienation. Customary people are able to lend their land to other people to make it available to other people to use. But they don't have the right, at least the living people don't have the right, to be able to sell the land, to alienate it, to dispossess the future generations. Because one way or another, it must return to the future generations. In a sense, if indigenous people accept payment for the sale of their land, the very practice of accepting that payment means that they have deserted their tribal laws and customs and spirituality, which ultimately comes back to their very understanding of themselves and their origin. And so accepting the payment for land actually negates their rights to the land in the first place. It produces a very difficult situation for indigenous people faced with that reality. And it's one of the reasons why even when indigenous people have accepted payment in exchange for their land, not only in Australia but in most other parts of the world as well, they haven't understood that it is actually a permanent and complete severance of their relationship with the land that they are contracting. Usually they understand it more in terms of something like a lease, where the right to occupy the land has been given, and usually only for the life of the people to whom it is given. We'll come back to looking at the implications for land tenure later on, but before we do, I want to introduce what we will look at as the various forms of native tenure. I've said that there's this universal tendency of the indigenous people to resist any form of alienation or sale of their land. This would suggest that there is some kind of universality in the way that indigenous people treat their land. This is not quite correct. While the principles behind their ownership are in fact curiously similar, regardless of where on the planet we find them. There are at least three different broad forms of native tenure, and each of these can be divided into many different forms found practiced by different particular peoples and tribes. The first and simplest belongs to hunter-gatherer societies and is found in countries like Australia, parts of Africa, and amongst nomadic people. And this is where the whole tribe shares all of the land. In practice, they tend to use it not particularly intensively at all. Hunter-gatherers are notorious for the amount of land they need in order to be able to find the game for their food and their chance appropriation of vegetable food sources, which they don't farm, but rather find wild. And obviously, they very quickly will farm it all out or exploit a local area and so they need to be able to move from area to area. And in this fit simple form there is no particular association between any single member or family within the tribe and a particular area of land. The next form of native tenure is what I'll be referring to as family or life tenure because it relates to the allocation to families while the families are alive, and in some cases simply to living people, 
of particular pieces of land. This type of tenure can be found on the Murray Islands and also in various parts of the Pacific and elsewhere. It is particularly appropriate when Indigenous people are involved in some form of stable agricultural activity or stable permanent village location. In this case you find that it is appropriate for individuals to have particular relationship with that land that they are particularly caring for, say in planting a garden or planting crops or clearing or whatever. In this case, it appears that there is something similar to the Western understanding of delineated personal property. And this is why the Murray Islands was particularly appropriate for mounting the case that Australian Indigenous people did in fact have an understanding of property ownership. However, the family life tenure is better understood as a form of perhaps lease or loan from the community as a whole. This is evident in the case where the family, for whatever reason, is unable to carry on its relationship with the land in conformity with the tribal traditions and customs. This is often the case where the family simply has no children. In the West, in that kind of a case, the freehold one way or another passes to others. However, in the case of Indigenous people, the family tenure will revert back to the tribe. And the tribe will then reallocate it to some other user or leave it available in general as common land. What this means is that the ultimate owner of the land is always the tribe, even though, for various reasons of practicality and prudence, particular individuals and families are allocated particular tracts of land. A more developed form of this tenure is what I'll refer to as quasi-feudal land systems. We find this in Tonga especially, also in Fiji. We found it historically in South America, parts of Europe uh, and many parts of Africa and Asia. The curious issue here is that while the quasi-feudal land system is very elaborate and structured, it still embodies the same fundamentals of a very simple system. And that is that the land is never sold. It always is the possession of the tribe and the people, always with the obligation to pass on to the future intact. The quasi-feudal hierarchy is referred to as quasi because feudal land system is a particular institution uh, associated with medieval Europe. And the kind of instances you find in other places often do not have quite the same precision of structure that you find in medieval Europe. However, they do have the fundamentals and these consist of the entire people's land formally being the property of a single leader or leader family. And in a feudal system, that total ownership of the entire land of the, of the people is then passed down through a series of hierarchical levels, eventually down to the people that own, or no, that occupy and use the land productively. In return, rents are paid up through the feudal hierarchy, eventually to the highest landowner, the king or ultimate landlord or the superior chief. And there is some sense of proportion in terms of the proportions of income of product that remain with the occupier of the land uh, compared to that which is concentrated in the hands of the ultimate owner. In the European feudal structure, the rents that were paid up into the feudal hierarchy came with obligations on the feudal lords to supply certain services and in some cases material support to the community. And so the feudal lords were expected to supply law and order civil defence, 
and a level of infrastructure. And we find a similar thing with the quasi-feudal hierarchies of indigenous people. That the chiefly classes are expected to provide a level of order and management that enables the entire community to better function. The fact that there is this feudal-esque system to be found in many parts of the world points towards its conformity with a natural understanding of property operations. And we find in many ways that our understanding of individual private property using the freehold system is in fact an historical aberration. If we want to interpret customary title systems in modern terms, we could perhaps use the feudal model. However, it's perhaps not the most useful, especially when it comes to the commercial utilisation of customary property. When we look at the mechanics of even simple customary tenure, we find that it equates to something like joint tenure in modern property terms, where the joint tenancy is shared, the ownership is shared by the entire tribe. While it does require a little bit of a stretch of the Western mind to be able to encompass joint tenants who are in fact dead or not born yet, once we get around this, we can understand quite transparently the whole logic of customary ownership. If the joint tenure is by the whole tribe, then it means that those currently living just happen to have a life tenancy, a subordinate tenancy to the whole tribe. And one of the obligations they have is to pass it on intact to the future peoples, the future members of the tribe, as well as use it for the benefit of all of those living at present. This means that the whole nature of being able to use property for the personal production or concentration of wealth, which is a common theme in Western economics, is quite alien and in fact abhorrent to indigenous people. It means that profit taking against other tribesmen is totally rejected. If we give some thought to the overall mechanics of our basic attitudes to property, say with respect to dwellings, our homes, Western people have an almost built-in inclination to expect that they will spend a lot of their life paying off their own family home, but with the confidence that when they come to sell it, which really is selling to the next generation, they'll be selling at a, a handsome capital gain. While Western people take this for granted and somehow consider it to be normal, recent events globally are proving this to be at least questionable. The problems the United States is having with their subprime market is only one rather spectacular example. The problem in Australia in Western land use of the affordability problem with houses is really about the way that housing has become less affordable from generation to generation. And this is now becoming a major difficulty for the current generation, the young generation, coming up to the age of land ownership. What this suggests is that the Western habit of simply taking a capital gain at the expense of the next generation is perhaps not prudent and certainly not showing some sort of solidarity from one generation to the next. Indigenous people don't have that problem at all. If we look by comparison and extend our consideration of modernity and modern title, we can see that our modern title is nothing more than state sanctioned possession and it is a form of convention. That is, it's an arbitrary set of rules. 
It is something which has been invented by our community and changed by our community over a period of time. Even if we look over the last 50 years, we can see that property title in the Torrens system used in Australia has changed radically since the Second World War. During that time, there has been considerable changes in the rights that come with freehold. And these are the result of planning legislations, of environmental legislations, and largely they reflect the awareness that one way or another, freehold is not total autonomy or a despotic right to absolute property. It's a set of rules which simply changes as the community awareness changes. In some parts of Australia, say in the leasehold regime of the Australian Capital Territory, we can see that the effective economics of property in that jurisdiction have changed radically to the point where while it is currently still formally a leasehold system, it actually acts as a form of quasi-freehold. This is all consistent with the notion of a convention, a set of rules, because rules, unless they're grounded in some form of permanent, unchanging law or tradition, will continue to change this way and that over time. By contrast, customary title is intimately connected with the origin of the world, the very nature of the fabric of what the world is and how it came to be. It's got to do with the fundamental relationship between the doings, the work, of the entities that made the world in the first place. It is therefore as natural as our ownership of those things that we produce ourselves. If we compare these two systems, the convention of private ownership, which changes and metamorphosizes over time, which is modern title, and is grounded in very little of substance apart from the fact that the government currently is stronger and is the strongest organiser of power in the community. With the philosophical solidity of this natural idea grounded in the very fabric of society understood through their spirituality, we can see that the customary title, one way or another, is rather strong. We say that customary title is actually metaphysically stronger. However, we'll need to explore that notion which we will do in slide 10. What is the metaphysics of land title? First of all, we need to understand what metaphysics is. Metaphysics is the name of a particular branch of philosophy, which has largely gone out of fashion over the last few centuries lies as a result in the West, or at least in the English-speaking tradition, of the conclusion by David Hume in the 18th century that metaphysics was completely unnecessary for learning. While Hume's conclusion has proven rather popular, it is not proven to be particularly robust as an observation about reality. But to understand the impact of Hume's position, we need to reflect on exactly what metaphysics is. Metaphysics is the study of existence. It is the study of what is fit to be. It is the study of what things need to be in order to exist. It studies things at their most fundamental level. The nature of being, how and why things exist. And so when indigenous people link their land title to their understanding of how and why the world exists, we can see that there is a metaphysical strength there. While we often use the notion of metaphysics in some sort of connection with spirituality, it need not be so. Because metaphysical statements, the statements of what things are, how and why they exist, are in fact the very basis of all of our scientific statements. Because when we make observations and conclusions about what things are, 
and what follows from the nature of their being. We are simply making the observations and statements that are the foundation of science itself. For instance, if we were to say that water is wet, at least between temperatures of 0 and 100 degrees Celsius, we are making a metaphysical statement. We are making a statement related to what water has to be in order to be itself. If we find some substance that is not wet in the temperatures between 0 and 100 degrees Celsius, the one thing we know for sure is that it is not water. And from that understanding that water is wet, that metaphysical statement that might seem very trite and fundamental, we can conclude many, many things. Water is good for washing, and so on. And so we can understand the world better from the application of these metaphysical statements. Water dissolves things, and so it is very good for keeping our bodies alive and clean. And so we can draw many, many scientific conclusions from these fundamental metaphysical observations. Close related to the study of metaphysics is the study of ontology. This is the study of what actually exists. There is a slight distinction here, uh, which can be useful when we go further into issues related to the connections between customary people, their spirituality and their land title. Ontology is simply the study of what actually exists. So, for instance, we can talk about the existence of Santa Claus, which we can say has a sort of existence because we can talk about Santa Claus, we can write stories about him, and so he has the existence in people's minds and certainly in the minds of young children, even though he may not have the material existence that we associate with you or me. When we come to customary title, we can see that customary title is metaphysically strong because once we accept their spiritual assumptions, all the rest of their understanding of their title and their law regarding land follows not as an arbitrary set of rules, but actually as a necessity which is as necessary as water being wet. By contrast, Western culture has a curious metaphysics. And if we take that back to the notion of Genesis, we find that the Western understanding of the origin of things, of the earth, for instance, is that it's the result of the chance collision and agglomeration of colliding atoms. This is a radically individualistic theory of existence. And what it means is that when individual atoms have a chance collision and interaction, it is basically a random relationship between individuals. When human beings relate, it is likewise. We are individuals. We may choose to contract in some random connection. However, we have no intimate or necessary connection, no ultimate family ties, and so on. What this means is that our connection with the land is totally random. It is totally disconnected from any necessary metaphysical connection. We can actually not say this land is ours. All we can say is that our government currently will help me to possess my land and exclude you through the use of force. And that as far as my ownership can go. While the matter of the radical difference in metaphysical outlook between indigenous people and westerners does appear to make some sort of coexistence or even understanding across the two different cultures very difficult, there is considerable opportunity for coexistence with respect to property between western users of land and customary owners. We can understand this by reviewing the interest in land understood by customary people. First of all, there is the chorus that customary people cannot sell their land without cultural treachery. And so what this means is that there is one non-negotiable with the efficient utilisation of customary owned land, 
and that is that it can't be sold or permanently alienated from its customary owners. However, even though customary owners will not tolerate the sale of their land, they generally don't want exclusive possession. Now this is evident in history, but also it's evident from the very nature of customary occupation. Customary people see their relationship with land as born as part of their spirituality. It is not something they choose or decide for business purposes. Generally, the hunter-gatherer societies require large tracts of land in order to survive because of the relatively inefficient use of their land, at least as viewed by Western eyes. Connected with this is the tendency of customary people to be quite comfortable with others to occupy their land. And you see this both in the attempts at coexistence on the part of indigenous people at the beginning of white settlement in Australia. You also see it emerging in customary disputes over property where the apparent customary owners, at least in terms of their traditional occupation, are in fact people that have lived on the part of some other indigenous groups land for many generations and while the respective tribes might understand the issues of ancient ownership and who is a visitor and who is the owner this doesn't mean that the customary people have ever objected to sharing their land with others this certainly offers a considerable opportunity conceptually indigenous people have prior title. This is a legal concept. Generally we understand a hierarchy of property titles from a sub lessee through to the head lessee, then to the landowner and ultimately back to the state, the government, as the source of all land title. However, when we look at customary interests in land, we find that stands even behind the white government ownership of land. And so what this means is that regardless of what Western institutions are brought into place to manage the utilisation of land, ultimately the indigenous owners hold the ultimate title. For this reason, translating the customary interest into something like, say, freehold is considerably inferior because it places the customary interest below the Western government, which is considerably further down the hierarchy than where it naturally lies. Modern people see land as an economic resource, as a commercial resource to exploit and use. Modern people want to occupy land and use it either because of the space it offers or because of the resources, either for mining or agriculture. Western people have a superior capacity to realise the highest and best use and are able to use land very intensively and efficiently. This means that a relatively small amount of land usually can be utilised to support the livelihood of a very large number of people. And this means that by using Western tenants, the economic productivity of the land is considerably increased, sufficient to be able to support both the Western land user and the landowner, regardless of who it is. Notionally, Western people derive income from their activity, their technological utilisation of land and their entrepreneurship. However, we do find that the reality usually includes a desire for capital gains as well. However, overall we can focus on the way that, at least for the economic utilisation of land, Western people do not need exclusive title. We see this also in many Western markets, where Western property markets are often dominated by landowner and tenant relationships. We find this all through the CBDs of most larger cities. 
where most of the commercial and retailing space is occupied by people who don't own it. Not only is this landlord and tenant relationship common, it is actually desired by many land users to the extent that there are a large number of organisations that have divested themselves of their land owning so as to become tenants basically in their own space. This has happened amongst larger retailers and the banks right across Australia where at various points they have chosen to sell their shops and office space in order to lease it back so as to release assets for their core business. What this says is that the economic utilisation of land and space does not need freehold. And in fact, modern Western users of land and space are able to use it even more efficiently if they are not the ultimate owners. To a certain extent, we can see this indirectly in the residential market as well. In this case, despite the existence of the Australian dream of every family wanting to own its own home, the development over the last generation or so of a large percentage of investment residences, certainly becoming substantial components of most city markets, indicates that necessarily there is a rising proportion of residential occupants who are not owners. As we move more in this direction, it is saying that white Australia is very comfortable with the notion of not being a land-owning community, but a land-using community, usually in various forms of leasing and renting. While these theoretical or fundamental issues in terms of the way that customary people and Western people utilise land suggest ample opportunity for coexistence with respect to the use of their property assets, the practical reality is often somewhat different. We do find that customary people are comfortable with leasing their land to modern tenants. We see that particularly in the Pacific Islands, such as Papua New Guinea, and also in Africa. And in fact, we see it in most places where there is a developed relationship between customary owners and Western tenants. It tends to happen most successfully where the customary people have political control. This is largely be because it requires a sympathetic government to be able to have the will to establish the institutional requirements to have it work in practice. In Australia, we're still a fair way behind that. From the perspective of the Western people, however, the reality is that, as we mentioned earlier, modern people implicitly are attracted to the capital gains residing with land as much as its fundamental value as an economic resource itself. And in fact, this push for capital gains is really a very key part that is emerging in terms of the Australian dream. The reason that people want at least their own home is not totally so that they can simply put pictures on the walls wherever they want, but rather because they are attracted to the possibility of using their home as their superannuation, so that they can sell it with a handsome capital gain on to the next generation of home owners. This notion of capital gain also exists quite prominently in the commercial use of land, where commercial retailing and industrial land is often owned by investors not so much for yield but for its long-term capital growth. When we look at historical examples of the push for freehold which is often championed by Western theorists and investors, we find that the push for freehold is often simultaneously a push of customary peoples into poverty. We've certainly seen this in many parts of the world. Hawaii is one particularly good example. Over a period of only about 20 years, Hawaii went from a island or a set of islands that was owned by its customary inhabitants 
when they freeholded their land, it only took about 20 years for over 90% of that land to be owned by foreigners. When we look at the development of Hawaii, we can see that it has had massive economic development since then. However, the indigenous people are now marginalised and are quite evident in the way that they have certainly not participated in any meaningful way in the economic development of the Hawaiian Islands. Australia is not far behind and we find similar cases on mainland United States. The Australian experience began with the initiation of the principle of terra nullius. Historically, it appears that there's strong evidence that Captain Cook was under orders to actually find Australia terra nullius. It was not necessarily a naive scientific observation. This is especially evident when the captain's log is contrasted with the diary of Sir Joseph Banks. Banks was able to look over the side of the ship as the uh, Endeavour sailed past the coast of Australia and see continual evidence of native encampments, their villages and fires and so on. However, none of these found their way into Cook's log. Instead, Cook found no evidence of customary settled occupation of the land and land management, at least none that he explicitly recognised and recorded. However, his log does have an indirect reference to property management. As the Endeavour sailed past the south coast of New South Wales, Cook noticed with delight the dappled sunlight that was able to come through the forest on the edge of the escarpment, which is close to the coast. Today, someone sailing past that same piece of coastland won't be able to see the sunlight coming through the forest in the same way, because today the undergrowth has overgrown the bushlands to the extent that it's quite opaque. However, in Cook's time, the indigenous owners of the land managed the land actively by burning it or backburning it out to reduce the undergrowth to make it easy for their hunting and to be able to flush out their prey. This example of long-term stable land management is now understood as something that was practiced by the Australian Aboriginals and while it was recorded in Cook's log, he may not have bothered to record it had he known its significance. By contrast, Australia was taken for the English Crown by an act of possession on Possession Island, which consisted of Cook sailing ashore, planting a flag on a short pole in the sand and reciting a declaration. From an indigenous person's point of view, this colourful rag on a stick is not very convincing as a way of taking possession of an entire continent. However, it took two centuries up until Eddie Mabo was able to prove that the indigenous owners of Murray Island had a stable system of land ownership that included stable survey boundaries or corner markers that had survived white settlement right down to the present time. The case of the Murray Islands was particularly important because it was one area where both the islanders had a evident system of land boundaries connected with the fact that it had not been overrun by white settlers because of its relatively lower economic value. we can consider what's involved in reversing terra nullius. We now have indigenous title recognised, but the historical granting of freehold has also been accepted as an act by the Western government that has extinguished native title or customary interest permanently and perpetually. 
This means that wherever we have freehold, there is no chance of indigenous title or customary title reviving. It also leaves the way open for the continued extinguishment into the future, so long as it is accompanied with just terms of compensation. However, we will need to move later into the question of how to assess just terms of compensation. At the present, we unfortunately still have an immature understanding of what customary title is and how it relates to modern title. In particular, the terms of the Native Title Act, which is a part of positive law or arbitrary law, rules that despite the indigenous people owning their land and having ownership which precedes Western government and Western law, the only entity that indigenous owners are able to transfer their land to is the white government. This stands in stark contrast to the way that any other property, real or otherwise, that is held by people in Australia is able to be assigned as a loan or a lease that earns some kind of an income. And the logic of being able to loan for an income, which is what a lease is, stands inconsistently denied to Indigenous people. And in this way, we have relatively primitive institutions for utilising customary owned land. We've mentioned that extinguishment is possible for government purposes, and this can include purposes where the government takes the land, extinguishes the customary interest, and then hands the land back as freehold or state leasehold to the indigenous owners for their utilisation. And there are many that argue that this translation of customary interest into freehold is in fact a way of solving the problem of giving indigenous owners a more economically useful form of property ownership. Putting these ideas together, we can see that the leasing of customary owned land is conceptually superior because it doesn't involve the extinguishment uh, for whatever reason, even with compensation. Unfortunately, despite leasing of customary owned land directly, is conceptually superior. It's not able to be done in Australia at present because of the legal blind spot that has resulted from the way that the Mabo determination was initially done, followed by the embodiment in law of the Native Title Act. And so this provides a certain complication which unnecessarily pushes back the possibility of a realistic solution to the customary title problem. With this in mind, we can look at the question of valuing the customary interest. First of all, the valuation problem doesn't include the question of the commercial value of the material aspects of the land, because these can be valued fairly easily and by and large uh, what you value when you value freehold. However, the real valuation issue is the question of valuing the customary interest itself. The difficulty here is that while different commentators have argued that the customary interest or the entire indigenous rights can be either below or above freehold, the question of how they relate to freehold is almost, well, impossible to resolve. And the reason for this is that the customary interest, the real unique contribution of the customary interest compared to some other aspect of ownership, is that it comes down to a spiritual value. And the difficulty here is that while we can put a money value onto material commodities, things that one way or another can work into the marketplace, we cannot put a dollar amount on a spiritual value in the same way that we can't put dollar values on a number of other things which we do consider of value. Uh, for instance, the valuation of missing body parts for compensation 
is something which is only really an approximation. This is because these things, spiritual values and other non-material values, are comprised of what are considered metaphysically distinct categories. And that is, they're groups of things which have value and may be compared with each other, but between the categories they can't be compared. For example, we can't compare the pleasantness of a sound or an opera with the sights that we see when we look at a fine piece of art. What is the sound of yellow? What is the colour of a orchestra? These things simply do not compare. And any attempt to is only metaphorical at best, which certainly doesn't give you much chance of solving the valuation problem when it comes to just terms of compensation. Because to justly reward or compensate Indigenous people for losing their spirituality and their very sense of themselves is something that simply money cannot buy. So this means that as valuers we have to be very, very careful when we approach this particular question. That is not to say that there are not aspects of Indigenous owned land that can be valued. And of course these are the ones which make the land suitable for something like a mine or a cattle property. What we find is that where compensation for extinguishment has been done, say in cases where the government has taken back land for infrastructure or as a part of the process towards facilitating mining, the compensation payouts are done with secrecy. And this in itself betrays the sense of shame associated with accepting money for land experienced by Indigenous people. The other more practical aspect, even considering the material side of the compensation for extinguishment, is that it always risks the rights of the future Indigenous people. And this is because while alternate wealth may theoretically be equivalent, the practical risks of Indigenous people receiving a handsome payout and then wisely investing it in, say, the stock market or some other form of productive property. Considering Western people often go bankrupt in the process of doing the same thing, the probability of Indigenous people being successful, especially when they need to be successful for their children's children's children, it's very, very unlikely. So for these reasons, both the risks that come from the problem of trying to maintain the wealth of the Indigenous people and the very fact of the metaphysically distinct categories that separate money value from spiritual value make the valuation of the customary interest practically impossible. From these notes, it's now important for you to go to the readings and to go through the different applications of these ideas in the way that they impact on various issues pertaining to the valuation of the customary interest in land.